Hello friends, it's Jessica from Three Rivers Homestead and I'm back with another kitchen prep video. This is where I'm gonna share with you some of the ways that I was preparing for the coming week to make meals easier for my family. We are a family of 10. We eat three meals from scratch, homemade every single day, plus snacks. So there is a lot of work for me to do in order to prepare for the coming week. So every week I sit down, I make a plan for what I would like to prepare, and then I look through all of my recipes. In the coming weeks, we have many family gatherings planned with extended family, and I'm trying my hardest to keep my children healthy so that we don't have to miss any of those gatherings. So in this week's meal prep, I'm really focusing on immune-boosting foods and snacks and meals that will help keep these children healthy. We are in a lot of after school activities and things around a lot of germs in the average week. So our immune systems need to be boosted and healthy in order to remain healthy throughout the month of December so that we can participate in all of the fun gatherings that we have planned with our friends and family. So the first little treat I'm going to share with you is something that we've been making pretty much every day. I've shown this to you before in other videos, but I'm going to share it again with a couple little spins on what I've been doing to make this. So we make fruit gummies, homemade gummy snacks for the kids just about every day lately. And how I do it is I start out with five cups of juice, and to that I add 15 tablespoons of pastured beef gelatin. I buy my gelatin in bulk from Azure Standard. Now, depending on the type of juice that we use, we sometimes have to add sweetener. We're doing orange juice in this, and it does not need added sweetener, so it is just tasty enough without any honey added. We do blend it up a little bit, and then we're gonna put it on the stove just to warm. I don't want to heat that juice or it will destroy the vitamin C. Vitamin C is very sensitive to heat, and um, so all we're gonna do is warm it to the point where that gelatin melts a little bit. We definitely do not want to boil that juice. And I'm just preparing all of my little gummy trays here, and then I'm gonna start filling them. I have been adding to my silicone gummy molds because I originally only had four of them and it just wasn't enough. My kids were flying through the snacks that I was making faster than I could make them. So I bought more molds and now I'm finding that they fly through them just as quickly. If I make the gummies, they will eat them. And I'm just fine with that because these are a very healthy treat. There is about 12 grams of protein in just one tablespoon of that beef gelatin. And since I put 15 tablespoons into one batch of this. Think about the amount of protein that the children are getting on top of the vitamin C from that orange juice. So um, I want the kids eating these as much as they want. And really when you're splitting them between eight kids, it really <laughs> isn't a lot. Now, if you don't want to take the time to put all of these into the silicone molds, you could very easily just dump the gelatin mixture out into a nine by 13 pan and cut it out just like you would jello. But my kids love the novelty of the little shapes. For some reason, it's just really fun for them. And so I don't mind doing this little um, act of love <laughs> to make these every day if the kids are gonna really appreciate it. After I had poured all of the gelatin mixture into the molds, I put it into the fridge and it only takes maybe 30 minutes for them to set in the fridge. So it is a, a quick activity and then they pop out very easily as you can see. If you find that your gelatin mixture is sticking to your silicone molds, that's because there is not enough gelatin in your mixture. So if you follow that rule of for every cup of juice you use, you wanna use at least three tablespoons of gelatin, you find that the gummies are firm enough to pop out very easily from the molds. And when you're done, you have something that looks like this. The kids are already trying to grab at them. <laughs> <laughs> I really can't make them fast enough uh, for them. But so what I'm trying to do to boost immune systems this week is make them out of elderberry juice. So I grabbed some frozen elderberries that we had foraged for on my parents' property last summer, and we simmered those on the stove in some water for a while to make elderberry juice. 
There are proven immunological benefits to elderberry juice. There are peer-reviewed studies out there that show how this boosts your immune system. So if you can make some gummies a couple times a week out of elderberry juice for your children, it's just going to give their immune systems a little extra support and a boost during this cold and flu season when you want to keep them healthy so that they can attend all of the events and gatherings that you need to do during the holiday season. So later on in the week, the, I made another batch of gummies using the elderberry juice, and I'm using the same process that I did with the straight orange juice. I'm just doing three cups of elderberry juice to two cups of orange juice, so they're getting a little bit of that vitamin C along with the benefits of the elderberry juice. But since elderberry juice isn't sweet, I do find that I want to add a little bit of raw honey to the pan. Um, and then once again, we're going to warm this up. We don't want to boil it because not only would that kill the vitamin C, but it also would destroy many of the beneficial properties in the raw honey. And I'm using an immersion blender to blend the gelatin in. That really helps keep it from clumping up. And there you go. Here are our little elderberry juice gummies. The kids absolutely love them. And I love making them for them because I know that it's giving their immune systems what they need to help fend off all the flu and cold germs that are out there while they're attending their after school activities. In total, it takes me about 10 minutes to get the gelatin mixture into the molds and about 10 minutes to pop it out. So about 20 minutes total of my time makes a snack here that they will completely eat in about 20 seconds, but it is absolutely worth it. You can see even little Hannah loves them, and so I just thought this would be a great idea to share with you guys to if you're looking for some fun snack ideas for your children. All right, let's get back to our meal prep day. Now I'm going to make some of my dinner rolls. This is my favorite large family dinner roll recipe. It's a large batch. It's gonna make you about 45 dinner rolls. So if you're a smaller family, you're gonna to wanna to cut <laughs> the amounts down. So I started with three and a half cups of warm water in my Bosch mixer here. And now I need to add my fat. You could use butter or you could use any kind of oil that you would like. You just need one cup of it. I'm using coconut oil on this particular day for this batch. And since it's rather cold in my kitchen, the coconut oil is solid in um, texture. So I do need to get that on the stove. I just have this little pan here that I'm going to put a cup of the oil in. We're going to warm it up and let it melt. It doesn't take very long to do that. But as I said, you could use whatever type of fat that you like to use in your own kitchen. Since we're dairy free, we tend to use various different kinds of oil. Now the next thing we need to do while our coconut oil is melting down is add our sweetener. We're gonna use a half a cup of, of honey. This is some fermented homegrown honey here from our homestead. I find that it's a great way to use up fermented honey in your baked goods because you don't taste the fermentation in it like you do if you were scooping it out to use in something like tea or to eat raw. So this is a way that we're not wasting our fermented honey. So a half a cup of honey, we had one cup of fat, three and a half cups of water. Now we need to add our yeast. We're doing four tablespoons of yeast. And then we're gonna let that um, sit and rest for about 15 minutes, adding that oil first. And then as that rests, the yeast will bloom and then we're ready to add our other ingredients. We're gonna add one tablespoon of salt, three eggs, and then we need to add 10 and a half cups of flour. We are just using an all-purpose flour on this day for these rolls. You could use whatever type of bread flour or even fresh ground flour if you wanted. I'm using my Bosch mixer here to let that knead for about five minutes. And after it's done, we have this beautiful dough. I know a lot of you ask if I like my Bosch mixer better than my KitchenAid that I used to have. And I do love the Bosch mixer for large batches of bread like this. I think it does a great job of kneading bread dough. But other than that, I think for smaller batches of baked goods like cakes and cookies and things like that, I definitely prefer the KitchenAid. So I would say invest in a Bosch mixer if you're doing a lot of bread baking. Otherwise, I would stick with your KitchenAid. 
After we shape our rolls, we're going to let them rise for 10 minutes and then bake them on 425 degrees for 8 to 10 minutes. And I had forgotten to grease my pans in my haste, but they still worked out. We got a bag to put in the freezer to use later on this week. And then the rest of these I put into my little cake container here to keep them moist while we use them for meals in the next couple days. And they turned out great. So those rolls were for the children, but you guys know I am gluten-free. So now I'm going to make a treat for myself. This is some gluten-free one-to-one -one flour, and I'm going to start out by taking two cups of that and putting it into my bowl here. We are going to make me some gluten-free crackers to use as snacks throughout the week. Some of you had asked for recipes um, for those of you that are gluten-free like me. So here is one of my favorite little snack recipes that I make. To that gluten-free flour, I'm adding a half a teaspoon of yeast, half a teaspoon of baking soda, and we're going to do one teaspoon of salt. Then, because this is a gluten-filled recipe that I'm adapting to make gluten-free, we're going to start out with a half a cup of cold water. I'm going to have to add more later because this uh, flour acts differently than regular wheat flour. I'm going to add two teaspoons of olive oil. And then I decided to add just a little bit of freeze-dried beet powder just for a little extra nutrition in the crackers and it makes them a really lovely pink color. So we're going to start mixing that and as I mentioned gluten-free flour acts differently than wheat flour so this is definitely drier than when I make this with wheat so I added another fourth a cup of cold water. I'm testing out the texture and then I decided to add yet another fourth a cup of water. So in total, it was one full cup of water that was added to the two cups of flour. And once I was happy with the texture of the dough, I'm going to go ahead and get out my um, cookie sheet. We're going to line it with some parchment paper, and then I'm just going to press that dough down onto the parchment paper. Now I'm just going to take a little rolling pin and we're going to spread that dough out and try to get it as thin as possible. And it's all, I mean, if you want it super thin and crunchy, you could spread this out onto two uh, different cookie sheets. I like mine a little thick and still chewy, so that is why I'm spreading it out on one. We scored it with a pizza cutter, pressed our fork into it, and then we baked those crackers on 400 degrees for about 10 to 12 minutes. And when they're done, they're all crispy and delicious. I'm going to go ahead and fill some canning jars that I have accumulating with those crackers to portion them out throughout the week. And then when we make something like a soup where the children might have a bread roll with it, I can grab some of these gluten-free crackers and that's what I will have with my soup or whatever it else, whatever else it is that we are eating. Now let me show you another gluten-free recipe for me that I'm making to prepare for the week. These are some buckwheat groats that I have. Um, these are going to be run through my grain mill here. I have a Nutramil grain mill. I absolutely love it. And since I'm not celiac, I can run my buckwheat through the same mill that we run our wheat berries through um, because I'm not that sensitive to gluten. But um, as you can see, it will grind that buckwheat down into a flour that then I can use to bake. I'm thankful that I can use the same grain mill because it would be rather expensive for me to have two separate grain mills to use for gluten and non-gluten flours. Now I need to measure out how much um, buckwheat flour I ended up with. I have two different buckwheat pancake and waffle recipes that I use, one for when eggs are in season and one for when eggs are in short supply. Right now, eggs are in short supply, so I'm going to show you the recipe that I'm using at this time of year. So for every one cup of buckwheat flour that I have, I'm going to add one cup of liquid. You could use milk, you could use apple juice, um, water even if you wanted to. We use a dairy-free milk. And then to that, we're adding for every cup of flour, we're adding one teaspoon of baking powder and then we're also going to add a half a teaspoon of salt and that is the basic recipe so one cup liquid one cup flour to one teaspoon baking powder and a half a teaspoon of salt 
and then we're using our immersion blender to really blend it up. Buckwheat flour has a really interesting texture. It gets kind of gummy, and so I find that using a blender gets the best texture. And then we're just gonna put that batter into our waffle iron, and I am making some waffles ahead for myself that I can put in the freezer or fridge and have for easy breakfast this week when I make something full of gluten for the children. So these will be for me, and I'm very excited to have those made ahead for the week. Okay, now we're back to making some immune boosting food. What is better than chicken soup? So I figured it was Sunday afternoon. Why not go ahead and roast a couple chickens to prepare for the week? We can't add butter, so I add a little bit of olive oil underneath the skin and over our two little chickens here. And then I'm going to sprinkle just some basic Italian seasoning on the top. Nothing fancy here. The goal is basically to have a little bit of chicken to add to our dinner on this night and then to use the rest to make broth and have leftover meat for a chicken soup that I will give the kids later on this week. But while those chickens are roasting in the oven, Miss Elizabeth here joined me in the kitchen. We're just spending a little mother-daughter time chatting and doing some more meal prep for the week. So what we like to do is if we have lettuce in the house, she is working on chopping up that lettuce and making a salad that we can just have ready to go in the fridge for easy lunches. I am working on peeling some Canada crookneck squash from our garden this past year. And we're gonna go ahead and roast a couple of those squashes in the oven. And then I'll have some roasted squash in the fridge to add to our soup we're gonna make the next day. And also to blend down to have some squash puree to maybe make some pumpkin pancakes or pumpkin muffins later on in the week. So taking this time to just do a little bit of meal prep is just helps make my week go so much more smoothly. By the time our chickens were done roasting, we also had that beautiful roasted squash that I had mentioned to use. We ate off the chicken. What we didn't eat was put into my big roaster, the carcasses, um, and were added with some water and for about 24 hours they roasted to make this beautiful chicken broth. I took the leftover meat from that meal and put it in my pot and now I'm straining out that broth to go ahead and make some chicken soup. Chicken soup is another one of those things that if the kids have been exposed to some kind of cold germ during their activities this week, getting a good helping of chicken soup in their bodies is going to help fend off that cold. There have actually been studies done on this as well that prove there's something about that chicken soup that is just really healing for the body. So to that meat and broth, we're going to add some freeze-dried veggies from the garden um, and things that we preserved last year. So we added some celery, some sweet corn, this is some spinach powder, and we're also going to add some okra. Just lots of yummy vegetables. I love freeze-dried veggies for the purpose of making soup. Also going to add some parsley for a little bit of flavor there. We're gonna stir all of that around and then the one thing that is missing here is garlic. So I'm gonna add a cube, one of our little pucks of frozen garlic puree that will melt down into our soup. And then I'm gonna add about half of this squash and that will kind of cook down in there and add some wonderful flavor. Then we just really need to salt and pepper it and I'm gonna put this on the wood stove to simmer and cook while we go about our day. Later on, right before lunch, I asked the kids if they wanted noodles or rice in the chicken soup, and they said rice. So we went ahead and added some cooked rice and went ahead and served it up with some of those delicious dinner rolls that we had made on Sunday, and everybody had a wonderful, nourishing, hearty lunch here on a cold Ohio day. And that's what I love about roasting whole chickens is that I can typically get three meals out of it, especially if I'm cooking two birds like that. So we ate the chicken meat for the first meal on Sunday night. We had a lunch out of the broth and leftover meat. And then after I made the broth, I was able to pick all of this meat off of the bones. And then we will save that for either another soup meal or maybe I can turn this into chicken salad or barbecued chicken sandwiches or something 
like that. So when you grow homegrown chicken, you don't waste anything. You know how much work goes into raising one of those birds and how precious the life is that you want to honor that life by not wasting any of it. And so I picked everything that I could out of this roaster and we ha we're left with this nice little bowl of meat that will feed us for yet another lunch this week. Our last little immune boosting project, I have this organic ginger root. I'm gonna go ahead and peel some. I'm gonna pickle half of it. The rest of it we've been eating fresh in various things because ginger is also really good for your immune system. Um, but here is some of the peeled ginger root. I decided that I was going to make pickled ginger. And I'm doing this because Adam loves to eat pickled ginger with his dinners. But a lot of the store-bought pickled ginger has food dye and lots of questionable ingredients in it. And to buy pickled ginger without questionable ingredients is extremely expensive. So doing this myself saves us a ton of money. So all I'm doing is slicing that ginger as thin as I can get it. You could use a vegetable peeler, but I find that it gets gummed up really quickly and it's really frustrating. So I just get it as thin as I can get by slicing. And Adam doesn't mind this texture. It works great. But ideally, the thinner you can get it, the better. Once you get your ginger all sliced up, now you're gonna move on to making your brine. And there are many different brine recipes out there. What I'm going to be using is for every one cup of vinegar, and I'm using distilled white vinegar uh, for this particular project. So for every one cup of vinegar, I'm going to use one fourth a cup of sugar and about a half a tablespoon of salt. And then once we add all of those ingredients, we're gonna get this on the stove just to kind of get our sugar to dissolve into the water and the salt to dissolve. It just needs to warm up a little bit. So we're gonna stir that, get it on the stove to warm, and then start filling our jars. As I mentioned, store-bought pickled ginger is kind of a pink color from the food dye. And so I thought that adding just about a teaspoon or maybe a half a teaspoon of freeze-dried beet powder to the bottom of each jar would make it a pretty color that kind of mimics the store-bought version. And then we're going to pack our ginger in on top of that powder. And we're just splitting it amongst our five little half pint jars. We're going to pour our brine over the top of the ginger. And then we're going to prepare to water bath this. So since it's kind of sticky from the sugar, we're wiping the rims of our jars to ensure a good seal. I'm using my four jars canning lids. As always, if you'd like 10% off your lids, you can use the code in the video description and follow that link to get yourself some canning lids. We're gonna get our rings on and then these are gonna go in the water bath canner for just 10 minutes. And then we have beautiful shelf stable pickled ginger. And that is it for this week, friends. It's been a fun week. Little Miss Hannah turned one and we had a wonderful time celebrating her. I want to thank all of you for being here and supporting us and watching our videos. I hope that all of you are staying healthy through this season so that you can enjoy gathering with your friends and family throughout the month. We will be back next week with another video. Until then, have a blessed week, friends. Bye.